Um, just real briefly, um, let me see if I can get this to progress. So just real ba quick background. Um, I'm the uh, digital transformation officer at Wind River. My area of expertise is around the TMT space, which is uh, telecom media and uh, technology. So it bridges quite a few different gaps. And um, Wind River, if you are familiar with us, you'll probably know us for uh, real-time operating systems that we've been developing for decades. Um, our technology is actually in the Mars rover right now as it rolls around Mars. Um, we build a very high efficiency, very reliable mission critical type systems um, that live at the, the far end of the computing world. And so we have identified a need to really build up uh, expertise, capability and technology in that far edge space. And uh, that's why I'm here. I've got about 30 years of experience in the IT industry, a lot of that in the telecom space. Uh, I'm an ex Big Four consultant. And uh, what I do is, is lead you know, executive level conversations around technology. So if you're expecting a deep dive on technology, uh, it may not be exactly what we're gonna be doing today. But what I do is I live somewhere in the middle um, of marketing, sales, and technology, and I bridge that gap. Um, very frequently, we, we look at technology to solve a problem, and we don't really know what that problem is before we go solve it. Um, so one of the things that I do is work with our clients to understand what specific business challenge they're trying to solve for, and then identify the solutions that'll move us forward. Uh, like I said, our area of expertise is definitely in the edge and far edge space. Uh, and you'll see us in the news right now doing work around um, virtualization of radio access networks for companies like Verizon, Vodafone. And uh, we continue to work with uh, a lot of companies in manufacturing, aerospace and defense, automotive and other areas. Um, they really do rely on us for very, like I said, mission critical, real time, very low latency type systems. Um, I'm definitely a, a futurist. I look at where the technology is going and then I look at how to realistically harness that to drive revenue. Because everything we do at the end of the day, if it's not revenue related, it's really not a lot of point to it. We either have to drive revenue or drive huge efficiencies. Um, me, I'm just like a part-time farmer, I love motorcycles and I'm an esports guy. So I just wanted to give you a little background, have an idea where I'm coming from. And I'm not huge on a million slides, so if you have questions, ask them, uh, and I can stop and pause, uh, but I'll just go ahead and roll forward. So as, as you can imagine, my, my role is definitely around transformation. Um, I, I pulled a quote here from uh, Charles Darwin, and uh, I think it's relevant in, in our world. The quote is this, it's not really the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It's the one that is most adaptable to change. And if anything is true in the technology space, uh, manufacturing, supply chain, um, we know that adaptation is critical. There are just thousands of businesses that are going out of business on a daily basis as their technology or their product becomes irrelevant and is replaced by other technologies. If you look at companies like Uber, uh, you see that they, they could be replacing taxi technology, right? Uh, taxi companies. And so they've had to, the taxi companies themselves have had to adapt and shift as well, driven by a company that is making them adapt. So they say, you know, Darwin says, trans, you know, adapt or die, I say transform or die. Um, it, it's very critical if your company is gonna move forward. So real briefly, um, for those of you that, that may be familiar with the uh, industry uh, versions, we call it, uh, I, I call it industrial revolutions. Um, there are really uh, four major, major, let's say, delineations in industrial transformation, and I've added a fifth. If we look at the, the first industrial revolution, we looked at mechanization of the production line, uh, moving from doing things by hand to doing things by machine. They harnessed steam, they turned it into mechanical energy, they powered those machines. The first companies to adopt that technology were really the textile manufacturers. Uh, because they saw an ability to replace human power with machine power uh, to deliver a product that people needed at that time. They were very quickly followed by, by you know, agricultural, mining, and iron concerns um, who saw the same potential. So the thing is, there was a technology advance of some type. People saw potential, and it impacted society in some way. Moving into the later 1800s, Industry 2.0, 
uh, electrical energy came in, replaced the steam power. Uh, we moved into modern production lines for the first time. And um, we also started to experience things like unemployment. So we actually put people out of work as we industrialized. And there were some other impacts in the world, not just in the assembly line itself, but we had inventions like the telegraph that allowed ideas to spread very quickly and accelerate the rate of innovation and consequently the change. Moving into the industry 3.0, um, what we really consider to be the digital revolution, the computer systems came into existence, the human brain power was now replaced by machine thinking. As you heard uh, Sebastian mention a few minutes ago, they, they run a company that essentially automates uh, human intervention. So whereas a human would look at something and do something, they have a robotic process automation tool, which allows you to automate that. And, and this goes all the way back to industry 3.0. It's nothing new under the sun, but it's a new interpretation and application of that technology to continue along that path. Um, we also know that the communications technology really took off in Industry 3.0. Lastly, kind of where we are right now, we're, we're considered to be an Industry 4.0. Now, I've put an expiration date on this. Normally, um, folks will say that we're in it right now, that we are in Industry 4.0. And I say we're in it for a while, maybe another decade or so, and it could be even less, the shelf life could be less. I would love to know if anybody agrees or disagrees, so you'd let the, you know, put it in the chat if you do or don't. But um, I believe that at this point, we're really um, in a situation where there is computer machine permanence. If you can think of an industry that's not using some type of computer or automation, uh, it's probably an industry that is either bespoke um, you know, very custom, very expensive, or it's somebody that's going to be going out of business at this point. We also see that the machines are completely interconnected. That's creating the IoT or IIoT, which is the industrial Internet of Things or the Internet of Things. Um, we know that these machines are connected on the floor and across the world. We also know that they're connected to consumers via applications. It's possible for consumers now to even see where things are being manufactured on the shop floor before they get shipped and they know and they're notified and it goes through like that. Apple's been doing that for years now. We also know that data harvesting is, is serious business right now. Uh, there is the ability to real time analyze that data and take action on it. Again, this is where you see some of that robotic process automation occurring. And you also see a lot of uh, after the fact analysis of data or, or real time analysis of the data um, with artificial intelligence. So this is, this is continuing to happen. Um, I think that we're moving towards more of an intelligent, dynamic manufacturing environment uh, where you might be producing one product one day and another product the next. That's important, and, and I stop on that point because the infrastructure that allows you to manufacture, if we look at this, this string of, of events, it is computerized, it is, essentially a robotic assembly line. And all of that technology has been very static up until the past 10 to 20 years, and now it's software defined, which means we have the ability to change what that machinery is doing, change the actions, change the production of products, and really do that in a dynamic, you know, intelligent type fashion. So here's where I get to industry 5.0. And I put a little maybe here. I just, you know, I made this up, right? I don't know if there's anybody out there saying Industry 5.0, but I believe we're heading into it. And I think that Industry 5.0 is going to have a few very, very specific attributes. One is I think that man and intelligent machines are about ready to merge. I think we're going to be augmenting human capability with computer capability. You know, you go back to the, all the sci-fi people talk about wetware and putting hardware inside of people. Um, but you're already heading in that direction in augmentation. You're dealing with things like the virtual reality, augmented reality. People might be wearing glasses to be able to see something happening and be alerted that there's an issue. I think you'll see more integration into the human body, actually. And as biomedical takes off, you're going to see integration of those devices in, in the human body. Um, you may see in the medical area, for example, implanted devices that allow somebody to know when something's happening to them and get them to a doctor or, or prescribe treatment, perhaps prescribe medication automatically. These things are going to happen. Um, artificial intelligence right now, the way it's being used, is around production assistance 
And uh, it, it's like an add-on, right? An afterthought. But I believe that, that artificial intelligence in, in the industrial supply chain will actually start controlling the manufacturing process. When everything is linked together, at the end of the day, the artificial intelligence may realize that something's not being ordered as frequently, stop production of that item, start production on another item, and tie that into marketing, start advertising harder, right? There's a whole, there's a whole system of cause and effect that, that can occur. And I think that lastly, in Industry 5.0, we're going to see a, a real boom in adaptive and additive manufacturing. And this is going to really allow for radical customization and innovation. You're going to see consumers designing their own products. You're going to see them printing things out at home. I know we're still in early stages of that, but we're getting into situations now where additive manufacturing or printing something is being applied to medical devices, it's being applied to uh, metallurgy uh, and applied to a lot of different areas. We're heading there. Um, so like I said, I'd be curious if anybody has thoughts around that. So industry 4.0 in reality is where we are. I'll, I'll skip the industry five for the moment, but industry 4.0 has uh, very specific attributes and those attributes become more apparent as you move towards the edge. And I'll just quickly define what, what we, when we talk about intelligent edge at Wind River and, and some other companies may define it differently. What we're saying is that as the edge develops, right? The edge is the place where computing occurs closest to the person that needs it, to a consumer. So for example, if you're driving a car and you are immediately faced with oncoming headlights, your car might make a decision to automatically slow down, veer to the left, veer to the right, Right, these are things that, that have to be decided where they're being used. And so the intelligent edge is, is part of that. And intelligent edge is really defined, um, well, I'll say like four attributes or four capabilities. Number one is we're seeing hyper-connectivity. So everything is massively connected, whether it's via 5G now, or traditional Wi-Fi, or Wi-Fi 6, or Bluetooth. Everything is connected and everything is talking. Now, if you look at overall what's connected and what's talking, still a very small percentage, probably 10 to 15% of the devices out there. But as we continue throughout the years, it's gonna keep moving faster and faster and faster. Everything's gonna be talking to everything else. So you have to manage that. We also know that the edge and all these devices that live at the edge are software defined and are going to be software defined. So no longer will they be single purpose devices. they will be devices that can be uh, let's say, uh, allocated to do different tasks. One day we might have them doing one thing, one day the next. The systems that run it need to be updated. Those systems need to be secured. They need to be adaptable. That's where we're heading in this world. And that requires a tremendous amount of orchestration at the software level. We also know that machine intelligence, we talked about AI. Uh, AI will play an incredible role uh, it, it's it's probably maybe overhyped, and, and people think of things like Skynet or Terminator, right, where it takes over your world. But but AI is somewhat overhyped at the moment, but it is rapidly being leveraged in very specific use cases where we have massive quantities of data to sort through very very rapidly and be able to take actionable actions on them, right? Actionable intelligence. We also know that with this edge system, that the attack surface for hackers becomes huge. So these systems are going to have to be highly secured. Imagine my, my you know, my uh, scenario earlier where somebody's driving a car, a person hijacks it, runs it off the road, can't have it. Or in a manufacturing facility where somebody pushes the machine to, you know, stop, stop picking up a part and moving it somewhere and they just start dropping on the floor or defects aren't detected. There are tons of ways to hack into these systems. So they're gonna have to be highly secured. So these are, cool qualities, they're all things that we look at the intelligent edge, and it creates new opportunities. And these are, I'll call them business opportunities. We have opportunities for machine to human integration, any place where a person touches a device, that's an opportunity. We have opportunities around intelligent autonomous machine, machines that will move by themselves, cars that will drive by themselves, vehicles that will move through a warehouse, conveyor systems that will move product around, logistics, Everything that can be automated will be automated. It's a matter of time before we start seeing the drones and everything else that they've talked about out there. And lastly, at this intelligent edge, because things are moving so quickly, 
we're integrating so many different components together, you're gonna see radical customization innovation. You're gonna see things, I look at this as a pallet wheel, and you're gonna see this pallet be used to create lots of new and different solutions. At Wind River, we're right now capturing this ecosystem and managing it with a product called Wind River Studio. So we're doing everything from the development all the way through the management, orchestration, um, and uh, analytics um, in, in that environment. That's kind of where we're living right now. So we could tell you more about that some other time, but that's kind of the idea right now. So as you, as you put more machines at the edge, they're gonna have to have very advanced capabilities. Whereas before the machines were fairly dumb, fairly single process, what you're gonna essentially see at the end of the day is a data center inside of a device. You're gonna see a lot of the capabilities that, that normally you attribute to distributed systems being built into these devices. So again, if we're looking at a robot on a factory floor, that robot may have very specifically uh, laser welded the same weld over and over and over again. But now we start connecting it to other devices, um, to AI, we start connecting it to robotic process automation. We want to have that robot do multiple things. Now we have to make it very definable and addressable. So first thing we do is we have to get the connectivity going. So there'll be multiple connectivity types. We talked about this earlier, that hyper-connectivity. We're also gonna have to build networking functions into these devices. They're gonna have to be able to intelligently route traffic to different parts of the globe, be able to handle hackers, um, be able to interface with other devices. So they will essentially have entire networks built into the device. We're also gonna be looking at a plethora of different types of processors. Um, traditionally, we looked at Intel, like x86. Now we're gonna see other types of processors coming into play. Um, we're gonna see accelerators to do certain types of functions, like say process video. So there's gonna be a lot of processing going on. And then we're gonna also see that these devices themselves are no longer hard-coded for a specific task. Instead, they have containers. And again, this is another thing that we handle within the Wind River Studio product line is container management and orchestration. And what we allow our customers to do is send applications that have been what we call containerized to these devices so that they can run without any interference from other applications and be changed on the fly. Also allows us to scale these devices out, um, to be able to address them very quickly and do a lot of really, really neat things. And so there we're gonna be moving to very, very cohesive systems that are single pane of glass that allow us to manage these systems. Right now, it's a lot of separate bits and parts and pieces and systems that are out there to manage. We're gonna have to move to more cohesive single pane of glass. And as uh, you heard earlier, RPA, AI, all these different systems come into play and we have to secure all of this. So there's a lot of stuff going on here, but at the end of the day, these machines are going to glue the cloud to the edge. That's what I say. This is the final step where you're gonna take all those cloud application services and glue them down to the device so that it can actually function and do what it needs to do. And then it'll transmit data up and back to the cloud as required. So and I'm probably running out of time here, but as we go into these, um, I, look at, I look at a factory as a series of business outcomes. I don't look at it as technology. Yes, there is enabling technology, but when we're looking at a factory and we're talking about the intelligent edge, all the devices which are within the factory or within a supply chain, you have to be thinking about the business outcomes. What things are you trying to affect that will help your business make money or save money? And so this is an example of a flexible factory model that takes all these things into account and then looks at the different technologies that will come into play. I've got them symbolized here, but I also break them down into specific technologies that are required. And all of this that you're looking at here is the intelligent edge. These are all things that have to be managed from a cohesive point of view. And then lastly, you know, where's the opportunity? So we know that I showed you earlier the industrial revolution four and five, we know that we're gonna move between a four window and a five window at some point. And there are opportunities around that, business opportunities. There are new revenue streams to capture. There are opportunities to lift and shift businesses to different models. We have the opportunity for radical innovation to bring in new products and new prototypes. We can improve people's quality of life and drive extreme efficiency. So we know that that is gonna happen.
when you go to pursue these things, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to really think through this carefully. Again, this is where my business training comes back in. Is that initiative gonna create new revenue for you, or is it gonna drive radical efficiencies? And can you measure it? Can the parent organization sustain the transformation, or do you need a new division spun up? Which technology is gonna align with those business outcomes? Do you have a mandate to go through this change? And actually, is this technology gonna shift so quickly that your solutions will be obsolete? So a lot of stuff to, to kind of talk about, and I know there's a lot there to unpack, um, but I wanted to give you an opportunity just to think about the transformation that's occurring at the edge, and then you can fill in the blanks of all the different technology that's out there, and um, I hope that's helpful for everybody. Any questions? All right, that was great stuff. Thank you so much. Sure. Really stimulating a lot of great thinking. Again, you can think of manufacturing. You've got the factory floor, how that ties together with your centralized database and operations. Uh, you can think of anything. Uh, I, I think you started the, the session talking about the Mars rover. Nice. I, I would say that's about the most extreme edge computing scenario. But yes. as people look at re-architecting their systems you know increasingly everything's being centralized with thin clients or intelligent edge devices uh, you know and it's interesting we had one of michael's colleagues speak yesterday specifically on the issue of containerized applications and he was commenting a lot about that scenario where and i i told all the audience yesterday i'll tell it today i mean if Wind River is securing devices a couple of hundred million light years away, give or take 50 million light years. I forget how far Mars is from the United, uh, from the Earth. You know, if Wind River can secure those kind of scenarios, they're pretty darn good and you consider. And, you know, just, and I don't even know if they can comment on this. I know Wind River does a lot of work with three letter acronym. Uh, government agencies uh, that's way above my pay grade but when you look at those kind of scenarios when you look at um, people being able to communicate with some of the astronauts in the, in the space shuttle or on the International Space Station you know, it's very critically important but how do you do that correctly reliability I mean you can't send spare parts up to the space station anytime easily so it's it's a great um, scenario and I appreciate the perspective that Michael offered, which is something that I strongly advocate. You have to look at your job. It's fundamentally different. You have to be more strategic architects. You look at what can you do at the edge to collect data. Uh, we're gonna hear a lot from our colleagues from Amazon about smart factories. You know, How do you go about setting up private 5G networks in your factory to have more flexible configurations? So a lot is changing on the edge, but you know you need the right partner, and I appreciate Michael making his team available from Wind River to help guide you in that scenario. Anything else, Michael? No, absolutely. If we can help you with anything, let us know.